Ignition sequence start. Five. Everything. Three. Everything. Sounds. Sounds. This is Everything Sounds. I'm Craig Shank. And I'm George Drake Jr. This is Everything Sounds. An electrical engineer named Thomas Comerford Martin wrote an article for volume 33 of the American Monthly Review of Reviews in 1906. In the article, he mentioned that Thomas Edison once told him that everything in the world would be done automatically by electricity, and he also believed that the world would run from one keyboard. Now, someone still had to operate that keyboard, and Edison wanted to be the one at the switch. Edison went on to say, and I quote, Eight hours would seem the depth of slavery. Essentially, people working for eight hours at a time would almost be too much based on how easy everything else was thanks to electricity. If only he were actually right about that. Do you think he also could have predicted angry birds? No, I think Tesla wrote about that once. Yeah, probably Farmville too. (laughs) (laughs) Edison wasn't exactly right, but electricity is central to our way of life. It facilitates our comfort, entertainment, communication, and just general well-being. Music isn't immune to the influence of electricity either, though. And no matter what technology we come up with, there will probably be somebody at the switch. And that's where we're headed today. We'll get back to that article and its subject in a moment. But first, this is the man that will be helping us along the way. Okay, my name is Tom Holmes. I'm an electronic music historian. How's that? And a writer and archivist of electronic music. Allow me to pull back the curtain for just one second. We went to New York City to meet with Tom, but the only location that we could actually manage to meet was a small park that happened to have some noisy birds hanging out in the background. Just think of them as little reminders of one of our previous episodes. It was our very own Great Animal Orchestra in Manhattan. Speaking of which, we'll actually get to Bernie Krause a little bit later on. Getting back to Tom, He is definitely our kind of guy. He's got a lot of knowledge about two subjects we love, electronic music and dinosaurs. Seriously, he's written over 20 books about evolution, dinosaurs, and other prehistoric life. He calls himself an amateur paleontologist. Now, as much as we wanted to talk to Tom about dinosaurs, we were there actually to talk with him about his knowledge of electronic music. So we did that instead. Before we dive into it, we need to actually get a definition of electronic music that we can all agree on. Sometimes it's a little bit hazy. There's some debate over what is and isn't electronic music. But for today, we'll stick with Tom's definition. Basically, um, electronic music is electronically generated sound or electronically modified acoustic sounds used for what the creator calls music and I would not try to define music. (laughs) Tom became interested in electronic music at an early age. When he was 15, he'd search for records anywhere that he could near his home in Michigan. Usually, he'd end up in the discount or cutout bins looking for anything that had something to do with electronics. Over time, his collection turned into the Holmes Archive of Electronic Music. I, I think of it as a curated collection. I don't collect everything. I'm more or less creating a library of examples. And there's a few thousand records in it, mostly LPs. Um, I look for what I've been doing. uh, My whole goal is to uh, digitize the archive and make it available to people who are interested in the history of electronic music and might use it for research, that kind of thing. The collection is pretty big, but that's mostly due to Tom's persistence. He's essentially bought at least one recording every week since the mid-1960s. Tom's been finding examples of electronic music from all over the world that were released between 1930 and 1985. If you're wondering why he stopped at 1985, it's because clearly plenty of electronic music has been made since then. And that's pretty much the reason why he stopped there. Um, That's not what needs archiving. That stuff's out there. So what needs archiving is the stuff that people have forgotten about and um, so all examples of tape composition from the um, 40s from the 50s um, early synthesizer music it's it's fun just to collect and I don't care what genre of music it is the only the only thing I don't collect heavily is library music Um, although if it's a, a synthesizer player I'm familiar with I might pick it up
The collection starts at 1930, but one of the first electromechanical instruments was actually developed well before that, in 1897. A man named Thaddeus Cahill developed an instrument called the Telharmonium. Cahill and his instrument were the subjects of the article that we mentioned earlier. The Telharmonium was definitely worthy of attention. It went through three different stages, and the Telharmonium Mark I weighed around 7 tons. You'd think that as time went on, it would have gotten smaller like some of our technology does today. But in this case, it kind of went the opposite direction. The Mark II and Mark III each weighed almost 200 tons. And according to Thomas Comerford Martin's article, it cost roughly $1,000 per ton to build. It was played with two keyboards, and it kind of looked like a pipe organ at first glance, but there weren't any pipes. It was just wires and switches and rotating pieces that were up to 30 feet long. The Telharmonium wasn't intended just to be an instrument either. Keho also hoped it would provide a service to New York City. And they hardwired the instrument into hotels in the area, they, and they paid by subscription. Somebody would sit in at the Telharmonium and play it. Basically classical music, stuff like that. Um, it was polyphonic. We don't know what it sounded like exactly. There are descriptions of it would would make you think it sounded a bit like we might think of as a cheap organ. Um, the Telharmonium got some positive reviews initially, but it had one major issue that Thaddeus didn't anticipate or know how to correct. It, it used so much power. It would cause the lights in the neighborhood to go dim, and you know, they had to put an end to it. So that, that was that. Not only was it a huge power drain, Telephone users would have their calls interrupted by music that was bleeding through the lines thanks to the Telharmonium. Guess what I got for you today, doll? One of those new handy vacuum cleaners. Oh boy, for me? You shouldn't have. But what do you say? You excited? You bet I... Wait, are you playing the organ? No. Must be that darn Telharmonium again. Needless to say, the public interest dropped after 1906. The investors who helped make it possible got nervous, and the Telharmonium Company stopped operating in 1911. We don't have any recordings of the Telharmonium, and the Mark I, II, and III were all eventually disassembled and scrapped. The story of the Telharmonium speaks to why much of early electronic music wasn't widely known or understood. It was often cumbersome, expensive, or just too far outside of the mainstream for acceptance. Many early examples of electronic music came about thanks to academics, broadcasters, inventors, or basically anyone that had the technical knowledge to build the devices, the money to buy them, or the willingness just to experiment. Some of the sounds and techniques of electronic music that are so common now must have seemed outrageous when they were first attempted. If you had never heard a manipulated sound before, it might seem bizarre. Let's take this line for instance. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both. And what if we slowed it down? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both. Or reversed it. Maybe even looped it. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, and sorry, and sorry, and sorry, and sorry, I could not travel both. Think of how bizarre that might have seemed. So, it wasn't until the idea of tape composition in the, in the 1940s that the concept of electronic music changed from being just something in real time to something that could change time, where you could record something and then mess with it. It was a really important concept. And one of the things that still fascinates, fascinates me is that almost, not every, but many, many, many of the basic fundamental sound effects or ways that you can ma manipulate sound today on a computer are all derived from what they used to do with discs and with tape. Though it took some time for tape composition and manipulation to become widely accepted and used in popular music and media, some electronic instruments were being used in live performances in the 20s and 30s. The theremin was one of those instruments. It was unusual, but important, and still used today. Also, it was one of the first instruments that you could play without even touching it. 
Theremins usually have two antennas. They detect the position of the hands to determine both pitch and volume. The theremin was used in live performances as an actual instrument, and not just a noisemaker. However, it wasn't until keyboard-based instruments became more prominent that electronic elements became more common in music and popular culture. One of the early keyboard-based instruments was the Hammond Novachord. And it had, um, it had a very clever way, uh, uh, it was all vacuum tubes, it had a vacuum tube for every note. Uh, on the keyboard, but they could split it. So instead of having like 300 vacuum tubes, it, it could do everything it could needed to do with like 90 or something. It was an amazing piece of equipment. But of course, vacuum tubes fail, and it was very unstable. But um, that was a genius instrument. Then there's the Hammond organ. The Novichord and the Hammond organ were both used for sound effects and music for radio, TV, and film, but the Hammond organ is still fairly well known today for its use in popular music. There are few well-known recordings of the Novichord, but if you think about it for a minute, you've probably heard plenty examples of the Hammond organ. Most notably, this little ditty. Another important step in electronic music was the development of modular synthesizers in the 1960s. Modular synths are what most people visualize when they think of a classic synthesizer. They're the type that usually have a bunch of patch cords, dials, knobs, and buttons. There were two companies that were essentially blazing the trail with the technology at the same time. And there were two uh, biggies at the time. There was the Buchla. Uh, by Donald Buchla out in California in San Francisco, and then uh, Bob Moog's Moog synthesizer. Other companies were making synthesizers in the 60s, but those two were the most popular. Although their timing was similar, the same can't be said for their approaches. The Buchla was very different because it was it was more hard programmed to do certain things and circuits and did not have a keyboard. Don did not uh, believe in have, you know, trying to turn it into a performance instrument like that. Bob Moog took advice from musicians and many of them said that they could do more with a Moog synthesizer if they could play it like a keyboard. He thought it was only going to be a piece of equipment for recording studios, but adding a keyboard opened up the possibilities for musicians that wanted to use them in the studio and live performances. Paul Beaver and Bernie Krauss, who we mentioned in a previous episode, were early adopters of the Moog synthesizer. They contributed to over 100 film soundtracks, overdubbed the synthesizer onto albums, and combined the Moog with sounds in the real world. In fact, Paul Beaver actually played the Moog on the first commercial record release to feature it. It was a concept album focused on the signs of the Zodiac. Six medals for six heroes. They followed Scorpio's command through the frozen bloodstone sands of Mars. They were also responsible for introducing Sir George Martin to the Moog. But he'd already had a foray in electronic music by releasing a few tracks under the name Ray Cathode for the BBC Radiophonic Workshop in the early 60s. And of course, Martin would later use the Moog with the Beatles. Beaver and Krauss introduced the instrument to many more musicians, but some of them couldn't really figure it out as quickly as others. Uh, it was hard to program for people. They didn't get it. They, they thought something was wrong with it because it only played one note at a time. They, uh, George Harrison, the story with him is that he, he sent the keyboard back because he thought there was something wrong with it. And um, Bob Moog just, okay, I'll, I'll send him another one. But someone had to show him how to program it a little differently. 
In spite of its temperament, the Moog synthesizer was used across different genres. It was given the classical treatment in Wendy Carlos's Switched On Bach. Rick Powell even managed to make electronic country music with the Moog on his Switched On Country album. This and other recordings like it helped showcase what synthesizers were capable of by mimicking instruments, voices, and creating a variety of sounds to suit whatever the musicians and producers were trying to get across in their songs. Not everyone loved the Moog, though. Motown decided to give it a shot, and they more or less abandoned it. They used it occasionally for uncredited overdubs on some records, but they didn't really think it was necessary. They had a real horn section, organs, and just about anything else they wanted. It might not have been a highlight on a lot of Motown records, but it did create some cool moments. Walk, walk with me. So the, the cool thing was that what they did with it, they would find some really interesting little sounds that weren't like anything else, and that's when they would use the Moog. So you'll hear it on a Supremes record from 1970 with Four Tops, just in this kind of gurgling, bubbling, usually monophonic undercurrent under the music, and, and very cool. Even though Motown as a whole may not have been as keen on electronic elements in their music, Stevie Wonder and the use of his Moog, clavinet, and other electronic instruments really helped move electronic music further into the mainstream. Some of his songs helped demonstrate how electronic instruments weren't just sterile or spacey gimmicks. You could really inject some feeling into songs with them. There are plenty of other artists and examples that have played a role in the development of electronic music that we can't get to in this show, but it gets to another important point. When many people think of electronic music, they think of it as one separate genre of music that stands alone. That couldn't be further from the truth. Whether it's rock, country, jazz, classical, or just about any other musical style, you can easily find electronic elements wherever you look. And music isn't better or worse because of what tools are used to create it. The power of music depends on the creativity of the artist and what the audience is interested in. Electronic music is here to stay because, frankly, most music today already is electronic music. Some people may think that the challenge has disappeared from music making because of all of the technology that's now available. Tom sees it a little differently. He thinks that a DJ mixing tracks together is kind of like composing. The results really depend on whether the artist is controlling the instrument or the instrument is controlling the artist. If you want to, you know, so there's all level, all kinds of levels of creativity and electronic music, I don't think, is any more limited or any um, uh, less capable of uh, being used creatively than anything else. It's just a matter of pushing the envelope and finding, um, finding something unique. We could only provide a brief overview of the enormous amount of information that's out there about the early development of electronic music and synthesizers. You can learn more from Tom Holmes and find information on his books and website at everythingsounds.org. We'll also have additional information and a list of songs that you heard in today's show. Craig and I will always keep Everything Sounds episodes as free downloads as long as we make the show. However, the show does cost money to produce. We're not into shaking anyone down for cash, but if you'd like to contribute, you can become an Everything Sounds audiophile. Decide what you think the show is worth and chip in. And in return, we'll send you bonus episodes as they become available. Find out more by clicking the support link at everythingsounds.org. Everything Sounds is a part of the Mule Radio Syndicate. If you need some podcasts to hold you over until our next show, you can find Like I'm an Idiot, Running from the Law, and Decode DC at muleradio.net. And a special thanks today to Sam Osborne, Max Owens, and Ruth Reveal for their help with this episode.
Until next time, this has been Everything Sounds. I'm George Drake Jr. And I'm Craig Chang. Thanks for listening. <laughs>